Amen. Unless the Lord changes it, this will be our last message on the series we've been doing on the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, when they asked, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, he said, pray in this manner, and he begins to quote a prayer. A lot of people in the church world know the prayer, but a lot of the people in the church don't know the essence and the, the truths, what I call, behind the prayer. See, I don't believe Jesus wanted us to recite a prayer. And we see that in movies. I've noticed on movies if there's a, they're in a plane and they're saying we're crash landing and people grab hands and all start quoting that prayer. I think what they're missing is the, the manner, the meaning behind the elements, the tools, if you will, of that prayer that can empower each and every one of our lives. If you've been with us, and, and, and you probably just know it even if you haven't been, it starts off what our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Say that with me. Say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We talked about how before you ask God for something, begin to worship him out of his identity, not your identity of your problem. Too many of us go with all the details of what we're dealing with. Well, God already knows that. Why don't we start off and begin to learn who he is in worship. And hollow means holy is your name. And your name is your description of a part of your character that you want me to know. And I'm telling you, when you begin to spend time worshiping God, the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. He enters in the place where you begin to worship him in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such, uh, Jesus said to the woman at the well. When we begin to worship him, we begin to know him. And when you begin to know him, it's more than trying to get something from him you'll begin to understand his nature. Because some of us approach God like we're trying to get something from him, and we're trying to negotiate. We're trying to barter. If you do this for me, I'll do this. We'll try to manipulate. We'll try to emotionally manipulate, thinking that if I cry a lot and wail and scream, that God will have to answer my prayer. But God doesn't answer based on emotion. We receive, Hebrews 6, 12 says, we receive the inheritance through faith and patience. And I want to challenge you. If you're a first-time guest here, we give our guests anonymity, which means we're not going to ask you to say or do anything to draw attention to yourself. But I will challenge each and every one of you one thing, and that's to challenge everything I say with the Word of God. Because it's not my words that makes a difference. You don't go to battle with, Pastor Greg said, you go to battle with, here's what the Bible says. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have dead or trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. That's the verse I want to throw up on the screen. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Look at that verse. For thine, for yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Say, say this with me. Say, it's not about me. Come on, say, it's not about me. I want you to understand something. When you can get this picture, that when the enemy, Jesus said, there is a thief who's come to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10, 10, but I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. When you get the picture that when the devil's messing with you, he's not really messing with you, he's messing with God's stuff. It's not about you. It's all about him. He's attacking the, the veracity, the validity of the truth of God's word. Where the Bible says in 1 Peter that by his stripes you were healed. The devil's messing with God and his word. It's not about you. You belong to him. The Bible says you've been redeemed, which means purchased, not by with corruptible things, but incorruptible. You've been purchased, redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. How many people are born again Christians in this house? If you've been, I'm telling you, that means you don't belong to you, you belong to him. Right? Now think of the difference. If you're walking outside to a parking lot and you see somebody messing with someone's car, you might walk by and say, mm, glad it's not my car. You might say, mm, that's not right. I can't believe people these days are still doing that. You might think, hey, someone needs to say something or call the police. Okay, so you got options. But if you walk outside and someone's messing with your car, you don't walk by and say, mm, I really like that car. The shame. No, what do you do? You rise up. You stand up and say, wait a minute, that's not right. You belong to God. You belong to God. And the Bible says when the enemy comes in, on the Old Testament, it'll say when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will set up a standard against him. But what you have to understand, two things out of that, is that there is, A, no comma in the Hebrew language. 
Secondly, a flood means it cannot be contained and the devil can be contained. What am I telling you? When the enemy comes against you, comma, like a flood, the Spirit of God will set up a standard against him. I'm telling you, you gotta have the mindset. When the devil starts messing with you, before he gets to knocking the door down, before he gets to pushing the doorbell, before he even gets to your street, all of a sudden the Spirit of God knows all things and he will rise up like a flood without you even knowing because no weapon formed against you will prosper. That means past weapons, future, present weapons, future weapons. When God said it, it's he's, he lives in the what realm of eternity, not in the timeline that we understand, but he's greater than that. So that means when he says it, he can look amongst all of time and say, I see everything. The Bible says he sees the end equally as he does the beginning. He is Revelation 22. He is, she said, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. That means the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He, there's nothing outside of God that can, and when he looks through time, he says, listen, every weapon I've seen and before the devil can come up with a new weapon, a new disease, a new problem, a new headache, God said, I've already seen it and I already have taken care of it in the name of Jesus. I speak by the authority of the word of God. God in the name of Jesus and no weapon formed against you will prosper starting this day. The, the walls of your enemy are crumbling before you. No chain can hold you. I set you free in the name of Jesus. You say, Pastor Greg, that's a little different. I'm not used to that. That's okay. Just hang on. We'll be fine. Because the word goes forth, Isaiah 55, 11, it will not return void. Jesus is the beginning. I mean, in the whole context of the prayer, it starts off with our Father, which art in heaven. It starts with God, and it ends with God. Some translations take this verse out, but I'm telling you, it belongs. Because we start with him, and we end with him. And it's all about him. Say, it's all about him. David understood this when David was fighting the giant. When David was going after Goliath, David wasn't going after Goliath because he was threatened. He wasn't going after Goliath because uh, Goliath was threatening his stuff. He was going after Goliath because Goliath was threatening God's stuff. You want to be blessed? You want to live a generous life? It's learning not to be generous just for yourself, but being open for God to show you that when God's saying, listen, the enemy is attacking this person, you recognize I'm going to rise up and do something if they can. Why? Because he belongs to God, and I will fight for God. Goliath, this day you have not defied the armies. You've defied the armies of the living God, and this day he will put you in my hands and give me victory. It wasn't you've messed with the wrong person. You've messed with the wrong God. And there's some of you here, you have been tormented. You have been uh, laughed at. You've been dogged by your neighbors. I'm telling you that the, that the thunder of God is about to reign in your neighborhood. And they will regret ever mocking your God. You don't even have to do anything. You say, that's kind of mean. That's not mean. It's God. He said, listen, you don't need revenge. I'll get them. Revenge belongs to me. I'm telling you, there is coming to the body of Christ a holy reverence for the goodness of God, for the presence of God, for the power of God. We will not be men and women of God who are weak, who are timid, who are hiding out, who are afraid. No, not just some people celebrate loudly in the church and walk out and they're quiet. I'm telling you, the life that you live, you don't have to be weird. You don't have to overpower people with your voice. You just be you. You let God be God. And I'm telling you, there is coming a reverence for the presence and the reality of who Jesus is. It's high time people start seeing Jesus and not religion. I'm not into religion. I define religion as man's rules that get to God. I'm into a real relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm into a real relationship. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For yours is the kingdom. For yours is the power. It's God's kingdom. It's God's power. We don't have to operate and be subject to the kingdom of the world. No, we can override the kingdom of the world with the kingdom of God because you are a child of God. Listen to me, church. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but listen to me. God did not put you on this earth for you to tell him how bad it is. 
God put you on this earth for you to bring his kingdom, his order, his power, his goodness, his presence into your world. He's brought you into this place so you can bring a change agent to your school. Change agent. I wish I worked at one of those places that everybody loved Jesus and have a prayer. And there's not one Christian but me. I'm the only one pastor. I just don't know what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Quit hiding the light. Be the light. Shine the light. And God will use you to reach somebody. It's easier to have everything catered to you and for you. But it's another thing to be a spiritual pioneer. And some of you are like, why don't I just get it handed to me? Listen, there's a greater reward. Be a spiritual pioneer that walks through the valley of darkness and said, I'm not going to be afraid. And when I leave here, it's going to be better. There will be prayer meetings. There will be Bible studies at lunchtime. There will be people praying for each other. There will be Christians in this world. Not because I'm going to recruit some, but I'm going to find some that don't know Jesus, that need to know Jesus. And I'm not going to be weird and force them all, but I'm going to be the light. And when your light, darkness can't stand it, but those who need him will be drawn to you. I've seen it work. Folks, I've gone to, one example is restaurants. If I go to a restaurant on a regular basis, I don't tell them I'm a Christian. I don't tell them I'm a pastor. I just am kind to people. I encourage people. And you know what? After all, you tip them well. They're going to be talking to you. They're going to get to know about you. And I have had managers sit down while on shift and begin to open their heart, crying, asking for prayer. I didn't come and say, who needs prayer? No, I just came to eat. But while I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm also being who God's called me to be. Don't be something you're not. Don't imitate somebody else. Don't talk like something else. Be you. Be the you that God created you to be. For it's all about him. It's all about him. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. As I was studying this, the Lord brought to my attention the 23rd Psalm. Do you remember this one? The Lord is my shepherd. Right? I shall not want. Now, you look at different translations. Some say, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall never be in need. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack any good thing. Any way you want to read it, it's a good verse. The Lord, say with me, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But there's times in all of our lives, let's be real. There's times in all of our lives where we face a season of maybe lack or want. Jesus said, in this world, you'll deal with trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome. Right? Stay with me. And I know, even from my own personal walk with God, in those times, I begin to look for the shepherd. I begin to look for the healer, if I'm dealing with sickness and fighting sickness. I look for the provider. For he's my Jehovah Jireh, the God who saw my need before there was ever a need and made provision through the cross. But the Lord dropped in my heart. He said, the problem that my children are dealing with is that they're looking for the shepherd. Stay with me. We begin to pursue the shepherd. But the reality, if we look at that verse again, it's Psalms 23, and they'll throw it on screen. The Lord is my shepherd. Are you ready? Don't pursue the shepherd Pursue the Lord. You say, aren't they the same? Yes. But a lot of people don't want to pursue Jesus as Lord. They want Jesus as healer. Jesus as provider. Jesus as protector. Jesus the one with the benefits. And I'm looking for the benefits, so I'm crying out to Jesus with the benefits. And before you do that, I'm telling you, you need to pursue Jesus as my Lord. There's a lot of people go to church and they know Jesus as their Savior. But they don't know him as their Lord. And when you, when you understand lordship, that means it's not about you. It's all about him. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. He is the Word of God. And many times we look to say, Lord, I need you to heal. I need you to deliver. I need you to protect. I need these benefits. But I don't want you to be Lord of my life. 
And this is a challenge for every believer because we got to keep coming back because the devil will convince us that it's my time, my life, my money, my, my problem. It's all about me, and I'll use Jesus as almost a, uh, a delivery person for the things that I can't do on my own. Lord, I'm short, on, I'm short this month on this. I have my to-dos of the things I want to happen in my life, and they're not all happening yet. Can you fill in the gap? God's not, God's not to be your gap filler. He's to be your Lord. It's about Jesus being Lord. Don't shut me down. Because it's easy to say, I'm going to go clubbing on Friday, and I'll get into church on Sunday just to pray a quick prayer if I need anything. Don't look at me that way. Don't you look at me that way. And we can't understand why we don't see the shepherd. We don't see the benefits of the healer. We don't see the benefits of the provider. And he's there and wants to do that for us. It's because we have to come through the doorway. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father but by me. And we have to come through the door. John 10, Jesus said, I'm the sheep of the shepherd. I, she's on the shepherd of the sheep. And I am the doorway. And the, through me, they go in and out and find pasture. It's more than just I prayed a prayer and I'm saved. And Jesus is Lord of my life and I'm going to heaven. It's the reality. Of, if I want to live the life that God wants me to live, if I want to have what God wants me to have. I got to be willing to keep going in and out that door. What is that door? The truth of his word. The truth of his word. And come in and approach and say, Lord, I'm not going to do it my way, but I open my heart. That's what meekness is. Those who are meek will inherit the earth. Why? Because meekness is not being weak. Meekness is being open to learn. Lord, if there's something in my life that's not right. Lord, if there's something I'm missing. Lord, if I'm not seeing it correctly, show me. I open up my heart. I open up my life. I open up my understanding. Teach me to do your will, David said. Teach me to do your will. David said, teach me to do your will. Because when you get saved, you don't automatically know it all. Nobody does. And too many times we run into problems. And in our problems, we look for Jesus with the benefits. And not Jesus with the Lord. Lord, you're my provider. Why, are, why haven't you given me abundance yet? Well, you, every time I give you abundance, you go down to the boat and blow it on. Uh, am I speaking the truth? It's not pressing in to get something. It's pressing in to know someone. Let me say that again. It's not pressing in in prayer and fasting and the word to get something. It's pressing in to know someone. When you are connected, when you know the who, before you know the how, the why, the when, the what, the where. When you focus on the who, Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. It's making that connection out of that relationship and he can flow the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. The Lord is my now is my shepherd. Therefore, I won't have any need or want. It's a human tendency. I know we've all been there. We all deal with this. And when we think we got it resolved, we come up with another situation. And we gotta keep ourselves in that place of Jesus, your Lord. I know I want to do this. And Lord, I know. Let's get real. I can't do this. I know what you're showing me to do, but I can't do this. I'm not ready to forgive that person. I'm not ready to start giving my tithes and offerings. I'm not ready to help out. I'm not ready to be praying for somebody. I'm not ready. And that's why Philippians says he will give you the desire and the ability to do what pleases him. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will place, he will give you the desires of your heart. And I will challenge the idea that it's, if you delight yourself in God, that he will give you what you want. I believe what it's saying is, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will place his desires in your heart. Because the next verse says, commit your works to him. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. What is it? The desires. So maybe you're struggling here and the devil's screaming, there's no way you could do this. You've tried it before, you failed. You went to church once and you skipped for eight months. You gave one, you, you tied for two weeks and then you had unexpected bills and you couldn't do it no more. You tried to forgive somebody and it wasn't real. You know it wasn't real. You're still angry. Listen, you obey by faith, but he gives you the power and the ability. He gives you the grace. And you know, we've been taught grace is the unmerited favor of God. No, you can't change it. Listen, the Bible says that God gives grace to the humble and rebukes the proud. 
So there is something you can do to increase the grace of God in your life. Being humble, saying, God, I, I can't get this on my own. I don't understand this all on my own. So I'm approaching you. I belong to you. You are my Lord. Show me. And then empower me to do this because I need you. Do you know you can't even love God without the Holy Spirit helping you? The Bible says, for the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Oh, I love Jesus. Without Jesus, you can't even love Jesus. And us getting real and say, all right, Lord, I want to do this right. Instead of me just trying to get stuff from you, I want to know you. That I might know him in the power of his resurrection, Paul said. Because there will be times in our life, and sometimes even God will give us the opportunity. But we see it played out in Matthew 13. We also see it played out in Moses' life. And God said, Moses, we're here at the promised land. This is Greg Bruce translation, by the way. We've defeated your enemies. I've healed everyone. You know, the Bible says that when they left Egypt, after 400 years of slavery, when they were leaving, there was not one feeble person amongst them. Now, either A, God healed them all, or they, B, had a ditch, and they pushed all the feeble folk away. And I don't believe it's the B option. I believe God healed them all. Not one sick person amongst them. They walked away with the gold of the most richest country on the planet of their time. So God rewarded them. He paid them back. Hallelujah. He healed them. He delivered them, destroyed their enemies. He brought them through the whole process to the promised land. And he said, now, Moses, I'm going to send you with an angel to go into the promised land. It's yours. And, angels, and Moses spoke up and said, God, search it out. And Moses said, God, what separates us from any other nation of the world? Is it not your presence? If you don't go, we don't go. If you don't go, we don't go. Can you imagine having the heart for God so much that you're saying, even the things that you're providing me, if they seem like they are going without your presence, your anointing, I don't want them. I want you number one. You are Lord. You are Lord. You are top priority, top dog, number one. There is no number two. You are number one. No questions asked. And anything that tries to come into conflict with that must bow its knee or be removed because there can only be number one, number one. And Jesus, you're number one. The Lord is my shepherd, for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. It's all about Jesus. As we decrease in our own ambitions and say, Lord, you show me what to do. Because if you look at the teachings of Jesus, it was all about he who obeys the will of my Father will enter into the kingdom of God. God, I want to do what you want. I want you to be not only my Savior, and praise God, he saved us. Aren't you glad you're saved? Not just my healer, and praise God for healing. Aren't you glad that you're healed today? Even if you feel weak right now, the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong in the strength of the Lord. He's your provider. Aren't you glad that he wants you blessed in the increase of God and provision of God? I mean, the world is like, church, the world has lied to us long enough. God doesn't want you in debt. God does not want you freaked out with poverty. God does not want you struggling. He wants you to have not only enough for you to live and take care of your stuff, but to help build the kingdom of God and see people get saved. Are you, are you with me? The peace of God, all those things are so important. All those things belong to us. But the number one thing is, is he Lord of our life? For the Lord is my shepherd. For the Lord. Say the Lord. Lord. Say Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. Wow. When he's Lord, then whatever you need him to be, he becomes. And he guides you through his truth, through his word. And as you obey through faith, you receive it. Hebrews 6, 12. If you're here today and you couldn't say that, if you can't truly mean it from your heart that Jesus is Lord of your life, and for whatever reason, maybe you should never heard the gospel before. Maybe you thought it was all about rules and legalism and things you couldn't do and things you had to do. Maybe, you, maybe it's about stuff. You used to walk with God, but for whatever reason, you've allowed stuff to come between you and God. If any of those things are keeping you from truly from your heart saying, Jesus, you're Lord, I want to take a few seconds and I want to pray with you here corporately. If you'd be so kind to bow your head and close your eyes with no one looking around. If you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus in a real and personal way. And the way that I process, the way I experience, I don't know Jesus that way. 
I want to know him. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Romans tells us that with a heart man believes in the righteousness, with confession is made in the salvation. Revelation 3, Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open up, I'll come in. It's basically give him an opportunity. Open it up. Give him an opportunity to do what only Jesus can do. Let's all pray this prayer together. And if you don't know him, let this come from your heart and watch what Jesus will do. Let's say this together. Pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father. Let's do it together. Say, Heavenly Father. I turn to you today. I repent of all my sins. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, wash me in your blood, forgive me, cleanse me, give me a fresh start. Say, Jesus, I don't want a religion. I want a real relationship with you. So I ask you right now, as I open up the door of my heart and my life, I ask you, I invite you into my life, and I ask you to make yourself real to me today in a way that I know for myself that you're real and you're my Lord and Savior. I receive you today. I receive salvation today. I receive forgiveness today. I receive that real relationship today. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Now, those of you who are watching my Facebook Live, thank you for being part of this moment with us. If you've been blessed and want to be a blessing, or maybe you're a member and you want to tithe, all those technology ways are available. But we want to also know who you are. So please let us know. Simply on that timeline, not only give us your name, that's obvious, but also where you're watching from. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know. In fact, we've had people time on the timeline say, how do I get saved? And I love it that people that were watching the live stream all jumped in and start giving them scriptures and how to pray. And it's a, it's a great ministry and outreach. Amen.